Welcome, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, and professors everywhere. Um, I'm a little surprised by the turns out today, and thanks for joining today's uh, seminar, which is also IGB Signal Processing Society Distinguished Lecture. Now today, uh, we are very honored to have Professor Ray Zhang from NUS Singapore as our very important speaker. Now, um, I guess um, many people know who is Ray, unquestionably the leading, well, a leading figure in wireless communications research. If you imagine like uh, wireless communication is a fashion, okay? You wanna see the, the trendiest fashion in 2020. You have to look at what Ray is wearing. Now he got his uh, bachelor, master from NUS and PhD from uh, Stanford. Uh, his research, uh, which is some of the very hardest air, uh, things uh, that is happening in wireless communication include UAV, satellite communications, wireless power transfer, be configurable might mode and optimization methods. Now he has published more than 400 papers, have citation uh, that is uh, quite, well, attractive, 39,000. I guess it will be 40,000 put, put it soon. And um, has been listed as highly cited researchers. Uh, he got so many awards. Uh, I only try to summarize some of them. I'm not going to uh, uh, spell them all out. Ichibori McConley Prize Award in wireless communication in 2015 and 2020. I didn't know the 2021, congratulations. And then uh, Ichibori Signal Processing Society Best Paper Award in 2016, Ichibori Communication Society um, High Rich Hertz uh, Prize Paper Award in 2017 and 2020, and Ichibori Signal Processing Society Donald D. Fring Overview Paper Award in 2017. I think that one should be massive MIMO if I remember correctly. And he, he's, he's also very active in communication society as well as signal processing, serving as a technical committee members or editor. He's currently actually distinguished lecturer uh, for signal processing society and also actually communication society. And of course, he's actually fellow. So without further ado, uh, let us have a warm welcome uh, to Professor Zhang. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Ken, uh, for the very uh, kind introduction and also invitation. And also, I, I think, To, I want to thank you for organizing uh, th th this fantastic uh, seminar series and everyone here. And uh, yeah, I'm really uh, grateful that uh, you, you are here to, to show your support to me. I, actually, I didn't expect, and, and it's a, but it's a great pleasure. I see so many familiar faces and names. Uh, let me... Uh, share my screen okay just give me one second okay okay I'll just turn on the pointer so i can okay so uh everybody can see uh the the screen or oh, this uh, there's a window come out uh keep ask me to admit people uh, i don't know how to how to don't worry uh, about it. Uh, uh, don't worry we'll about it. Oh. We will handle oh, it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but it's blocking my win uh, my screen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, I don't know how to remove it. But anyway, yeah. uh, let's start. Okay. So uh, today, uh, Samidar, I'm going to talk about the uh, UAV communication. I think uh, perhaps uh, most of you already know. Uh, this is a relatively new area and I have been very active, uh, especially in the last five years and in uh, various IEEE societies, including communication society, signal processing, VT, uh, etc. And uh, there have been already many excellent uh, talks and tutorials given on this topic. And so in today's talk, I think uh, I should... Uh, how come I cannot go to the next slide? Just give me a second. Oh, okay, it works. Okay, so I, I think it's not necessary for me to uh, repeat uh, you know, the you know, introduction for the general UAVs and UAV communications. Well, instead, I will, I will focus on the, the, the main uh, or relatively new paradigm, which is uh, integrating UAV into the cellular network. Okay, and uh, uh, just to give you a quick overview, uh, what is the main motivations and benefits right, for this new paradigm? And as well as what is fundamentally new as compared to traditional terrestrial uh, wireless communication networks. And then I will spend most of the time on uh, uh, addressing the two main uh, research challenges, in my opinion, uh, they're most critical ones, uh, from a particular signal processing perspective, right? 
uh, which are the UAV trajectory and communication joint design. So basically by exploiting the UAV 3D mobility uh, for uh, trajectory design, the uh, communication performance enhancement, and as well as how to mitigate uh, the strong uh, UAV to terrestrial uh, interference uh, issue, right? Which is a very uh, severe issue. Uh, if uh, this problem cannot be solved, then it's very difficult to integrate UA to UAV into the future uh, satellite networks. Okay, so uh, in this new paradigm, I mean, integrating UAV into cellular, there are two main, uh, you can think of a sub paradigm or, or applications. One is called the cellular connected UAV, right? In this case, a UAV is used as a new uh, area users or terminals, right? You can think about you mount the mobile phone on the UAV and then they are uh, served by the terrestrial, right? The existing terrestrial uh, network and base stations. Right. Uh, for example, right, a paler, a ground paler can remotely control uh, the UAV right, even beyond the visual and the radio line of sight range, right, by exploiting uh, the reliable uh, cellular, uh, the backhaul, the infrastructure, as well as the wireless access technologies, right. So this can help uh, achieve a reliable uh, control message or signaling uh, exchange. For example, this is called the control and non payload communication, CNPC. Um, uh, uh, data, uh, uh, data. So uh, you can uh, theoretically you can achieve uh, you know uh, you know reliable control uh, between the ground paler and the UAV, uh, you know without any uh, rate range constraint. And also you can think about in the case that right, the UAV, for example, in the in the aerial surveillance uh, applications, right? The UAV may take some real time uh, video or high uh, quality uh, photos, and they want to send back to the ground. Right, and in this case, they can also uh, send back uh, those uh, hybrid, uh, you know, data or photos or videos to back to the base stations. Right, so this is a, called the payload uh, data application. You can also imagine other uh, promising applications. For example, edge computing, right, which is not very promising in, in the in the, in the next generation cellular. So you can think about the, the base station equate very powerful with the the computing uh, resources, and so the UAV can offload is a uh, you know. Uh, some uh, computationally intensive task uh, to the, the base station, right? And this is the, the way that to uh, enable in the real time, for example, trajectory optimization, which I will talk about later. And as well as the localization, right? For example, in the scenario that you do not have, uh, you know, GPS uh, coverage, right? Then we can also rely on the, the ground base station to enable the localization for, for the UAVs. Well, the, on the other hand, we can also use UAVs uh, as uh, uh, the new uh, communication platforms, right? So this is called the UAV assisted communication. Well, the role of UAV is swapped, right? Uh, instead of as a terminal, now it becomes an area base station, or you can think of AP or relay, right? And in the scenario, for example, the, the, the terrestrial network is not available, right? Either get highly congested or is get, uh, you know, uh, uh, malfunctioning, right? Due to some natural disaster. In this case, right, we can we can send the UAV as uh, on demand as uh, you know temporary uh, base stations, right, to provide the service to uh, to the cellular uh, to the cellular ground terminals, right. You can also think about other applications. For example, UAV can be dispatched to as a mobile access point to collect uh, the data from massively deployed IoT devices like sensors, and also it can provide a wireless power transfer, right, to, to charge those wireless sensors or IoT devices. And as well as a localization, but in this case, right, the, the, the UAV can pro, uh, is a bit, uh, considered as a base station. So they provide localization service for the ground terminal and also for some scenario when the GPS uh, is denied for service. Okay, so I think uh, integrating UAV into 5G or the future 6G wireless network is a win-win uh, situation, right? And it's beneficial from, for both uh, UAV and the uh, uh, cellular industry. Right. On one hand, you can think about right all the main features right for 5G, right? Like URLC, EMBB, you know, MMTC, D2D, etc. Right. They can help uh, significantly enhance the, the UAV communication performance, right? Uh, you know, either provide more reliable CMPC or, or you know, uh, you know, more high rate payload and 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 the swarm communication, extend the, the cellular coverage and solve the, the, the area terrestrial interference problem. Later, I will elaborate more. And as well as other functions, right? Like cellular positioning and edge computing, right? So all of this will, I think, will make the avenue, with, you know, for 
more uh, high value UAV uh, applications in the future, especially for those uh, you know have a have a very high uh, you know uh, uh, demanding uh, the, the communication stringent communication uh, requirements. On the other hand, right, UAV uh, is also beneficial for 5G, right, because uh, it will bring new business opportunities by incorporating UAVs as new area users, and also, you know, to provide a more robust, uh, you know, and cost-effective cellular uh, network by serving as new area communication platforms. Okay, from a research perspective, you may ask, right, what is the fundamental view for UAV communication as compared to traditional terrestrial communication, right? We have been doing research for decades, right, for terrestrial communication. So what is the fundamentally new? Okay, I think uh, the best answer is, uh, is from, you know, uh, looking at the, you know, the, the, some basic uh, characteristics for UAVs, right? For example, right, most of the UAVs are at very high altitude uh, above the ground. Right. So uh, if you think about right in terms of coverage, right, I mean, if you think of the UAV as a base station, right, in terms of coverage, and this is better, right, than compared to the terrestrial base station, right, because it's all is high above the, the, the air. But if you think about a UAV as a terminal, right, this will be uh, turns out to be a challenge, right, because uh, now our existing cellular base, they can only provide 2D coverage, most of them, right. Now you have to extend to the 3D coverage, right, to, to serve the UAVs, right, at any uh, locations. Right, so this could be a new challenge. Well, because of their high altitude, right, most of UAV has a very high line of sight probability uh, for the channels with uh, the ground terminals or base stations, right? And this is the could be advantage, right? Because that means the uh, line of sight channel, right, usually has a less uh, feeding, right, as compared to non line of sight terrestrial channels, right? So this, in terms of communication reliability, in terms of micro diversity for base station or association and cooperation, as well as communication scheduling and resource allocation, I think uh, this could be an advantage. But on the other hand, right, the strong line sign channel will also create a new problem, that is the, the, the UAV and terrestrial network interference, right? That could be stronger than traditional terrestrial interference, right? which I will talk about more later in this talk. And also you can think about most of the UAV have certain uh, controlled mobility in 3D, right? So this provides a new uh, opportunity, right? A new degrees of freedom that we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, take this, take the advantage of the UAV mobility or trajectory design, right? To improve the, to adapt to the communication uh, channel and to improve the, the communication performance. And this is also one of the mid topic I will talk, uh, will address later. And, uh, and another, right, very unique for UAV, right? The UAV has uh, this uh, size, weight and power swap uh, constraint. Right, because so most UAV uh, has a limited payload, right? So they cannot carry, you know, uh, you know, too much, uh, you know, uh, en uh, the, uh, the energy, right? I think of the battery, and also they have all limited endurance, right? So when we design the UAV trajectory design for communication purposes, right, we have to bear in mind, right, the energy efficient design is crucial, right? And and this is also I was going to talk about uh, later today. Okay, so after a quick overview for UAV cellular integration, I will now address the two main challenges, right? The first one is that the trajectory optimization for UAV assisted communication. So in this, this uh, uh, case, I will mainly consider UAV as a base station, right? Uh, it, but you can also think about the trajectory design also applies when the UAV serve as a terminal, right? So first I want to give you a toy example, right? Just to highlighting uh, you know, what is the motivation, why we want to explore UAV mobility. So let's think about very simple setup, right? We have a ground terminal, which is served by a UAV and the UAV is flying horizontally closer towards the, the ground terminal, right? So in this precise, if you look at the channel between the UAV and the serving ground terminal, right? There are two gains, right? One is that the link distance between them gets shorter, right? So we know we have less pass loss. Right, this is one uh, source of gain, and the other gain actually is uh, is more interesting. Is that if you look at the elevation angle, right, is is shown here by the theta, right, as the UV flying closer to the ground terminal, theta gets larger, right. So based on the very known probabilistic line sign channel model, which is very popular for UAV uh, communication literature, that that means that the line sign probability between the UAV and the ground terminal gets higher, right. And so if you consider both uh, sources of gains, or you can show here, you know, one of the, you know, they give you a, a less pass loss, right? So the, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gain about 23 dB. And the other one is they give you higher line sign probability, right? You know, line sign 
channel has a much higher average gain than compared to nine line of sight, right? So both, if you're combining both of them, right, as the UV flying closer to the terminal, you have a 40 dB SNR gains, right? That is huge. If you think about traditional wireless communication techniques, right, like coding or power control, beam forming, it's very unlikely you can get this 40 dB gains, right? So this is a toy example. I just want to illustrate, you know, mobility control can bring you a huge benefit, which is uh, unusual in traditional wireless communication. However, right, this, is, this gain is achieved by exploring UAV trajectory design, but we have to consider other practical uh, factors. Right. For example, right, when we design the trajectory, now we have to consider 3D channel mode instead of terrestrial 2D channel mode. Because all the past laws, line of sight probably it depends on 3D UAV location, right? For example, the elevation angle. And also we also need to consider strong interference problem, right? You know, especially if you have multiple UAV serving multiple users on the ground, right? So there will go the interference, air to air as well, air to ground. Right, and the other hand, right, the value is backhaul, right? Because previously the, the example I showed, right? If the ground terminal requires the internet access, right? Then the UAV just can only serve as a relay, right? You also, also need to connect to the, some ground gateway or, or base station, right? So that means when UAV flying closer to the terminal, maybe it gets further away from the, the ground gateway, right? So the backhaul is also depends on the UAV location and also time barrier, right? So we have to address that. And also I said the UAV has a limited onboard energy, right? When you get this 40 dB gain is because UAV consumes energy to fly closer to the ground terminal, right? So that means that it will, it will have less endurance time, right? In the future, right? So we have to take in this into consideration. So in this talk, I was going to, uh, you know, give you a general optimization framework for UAV trajectory and communication uh, uh, co-design. And I'm going to introduce a lot of signal precising techniques and to help us solve uh, such problems. So first I will just give you, you know, the, the, some, uh, uh, some fundamental communication channel model. I think uh, uh, everybody here are all familiar with though. This is all basic communication channel model like relay, you know, multicast, broadcast, you know, interference channel. So what is the new? The new is that the UAV now is a base station, but instead of on ground, but now it's over the air and we can optimize its location and trajectory over time. Right, so that's the, the something we're going to explore. And in terms of communication metric, we can use all the traditional, right? The classical, uh, you know, wireless communication metric, right? Like SNR, you know, outage, uh, communication throughput, spectral efficiency, and, and et cetera. Uh, but the only, the only new thing is that if you look at, for example, the, the SNR, SNR expression uh, given here, now it depends on the UAV location, right? Either for the case the UAV is a transmitter or is a receiver. Not only the direct channel, right? Depends on the, the, the UAV's location, right? If you also look at the interference, right? It also depends on the co-channel UAV's location, right? They will also cause the, the time bearing interference. And right? so when we design the trajectory, we have to jointly design all the UAV trajectories because they will have an impact on not only the signal power but also to the interference power in the network. So this is a motivate us to provide to present you, a, you know, this uh, this general a very generic uh, uh, formulation optimization problem for uh, of our communication and the trajectory co-design, and you can think about there's two types of variables. One is QT, right? This is represent the, the trajectory. Uh, T is the time. Although here I only show one UAV, but you can think about this is applies to multiple UAVs, right? You have a vector of such, you know, trajectory. Uh, each of these you can think of sequence over uh, over time, uh, you know, for the locations of UA each UAVs. And the other uh, 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 type of variable is as a traditional communication resource allocation right, variables, right? Like a power, you know, bandwidth, and etc. And the utility function, as I said, you can think of any classical uh, conventional uh, metric. And, uh, but very interesting, if we look at the constraint, right? We have three typical sets of constraint. One is that only uh, this FI is only depends on the trajectory, which are typical uh, UAV mobility constraint, like speed, you know, obstacle, you know, this kind of, you know, in, you, can, you can find them in the classical, you know, uh, UAV literature, even though not for the communication, right? In the trajectory design, like in control literature, you can also find, you know, such constraint, mathematical models. Uh, well, the other type of constraint, GI, is only depends on traditional communication resource allocation, right? Power and bandwidth, I think the audience here are very familiar with. 
Well, the most interesting and most difficult constraint is the, the so-called couple constraint. That means uh, this type of constraint depends on both UAV location as well as the communication uh, you know, uh, design variable. Like the ISNR expression I showed in the previous slides, right? it depends on the power control of all the UAV and the ground users, as well as uh, the UAV trajectories. Right? So this type of constraint is the most difficult and, and, uh, to handle, uh, as later I'm going to show. I just want to put, uh, give a remark here uh, there's another line of uh, uh, UAV optimization uh, in, in the literature, which is just focusing on optimizing the UAV placement problem. I mean, it just optimize their locations, but not uh, over time, uh, not time bearing over time. So you can think of this type of problem, a special case of a UAV trajectory optimization, when you ignore the speed constraint and ignore the, the mobility uh, over time. And so in this uh, talk, for the sake of time, I will mainly focus on the trajectory design, but you can find uh, you know, all the techniques I mentioned, they all apply to the UAV of, uh, you know, uh, placement optimization problem. Okay, so I want to start from a very heuristic as well intuitive approach, right, for UAV trajectory or, you know, a so-called path blending problem. So I want to show this a very uh, 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 illustrative example, right? So for example, I have a UAV, I want to serve a, a a group of uh, you know very separated uh, the ground terminals right as i showed in the previous example right it's desirable for uav to fly as close as possible uh, to each of these ground terminal right so you can think about directly above each of these ground terminal right so you have the best uh, communication channel because you have the shortest distance and also highest alliance and probability right to each of these ground terminal right and on the other hand right I've, after uh, when the uav plans is passed right to to serve this ground terminal he want to minimize the total flying distance because he want to minimize the flying time right either to you know minimize the delay or you know to save is a is a flying energy right so this problem is very similar to the traveling salesman problem in the graph theory right that is given k cities and their locations I want to design the path such as, you know, uh, the, the traveler can visit all of these cities once, right, and uh, with the shortest path, right? So these two problems are fundamentally uh, similar, right? But and we know, right, the, uh, the, the TSP problem is an NP hat problem, but in the literature, there exists many heuristic and as well suboptimal or optimal algorithm that can solve the problem up to the size of uh, tens or thousands of uh, uh, cities or, or ground terminals. But I want to point out, right, for our uh, UAV uh, path blending, right, is slightly different from the traditional TSP problem, right? For example, right, in the traditional TSP uh, problem, right, the traveler has to go back to the original city, right? You have to complete the one cycle. But in UAV trajectory design, we may have different types of constraint on the initial and the final locations, right? Maybe they are fixed or maybe you can arbitrarily optimize. Right, so in this case, we have to modify the traditional TSP problem, right, to serve for, for this new purpose, right? If you're interested, you can refer to the techniques that given in this paper. And it's not just that simple, right? Think about the case, right? The UAV have a very limited flying time, right? So the time is not sufficient for the UAV to visit each of these ground terminal on top, you know, directly on top of each of them. Right, so in this case, we have to explore the wireless signal broadcasting property. That means, you know, for each for UAV to serve each of the ground terminal, it does not need to fly directly on top of each each of them, right? As long as it can fly sufficiently close, right, to each of them, they already can receive their data reliably, right? So in this case, we can define a disk region with certain radius. You can put the radius as also optimization variable because it's related to the, the communication quality. And then as long as when we design the UAV pass, it can touch right each of this disk region, right? It can guarantee to serve each of the ground terminal reliably. Right. So in this case, we can generalize the TSP problem to the TSP with neighborhood problem. And we can combine it to traditional TSP solution as well as some new optimization techniques to solve this problem. And we can have uh, even more complicated cases, right? For example, the ground terminals, right? Some are the source nodes, right? Some are destined nodes, right? The UAV serve as a relay. So when UAV plan is passed, you have to make sure you will visit the source nodes first, right? Because you have to get the data from the source node before you can fly towards the, the, the ground terminal to download the data, right? So in this case, we have this new information causality constraint, right? And uh, this will will lead to another type of generalized the TSP problem is that called the pickup and delivery problem, right? That means we have to consider the new precedence constraint, 
right? When you, when you plan the UAV pass, you have to consider the order of visiting for the ground nodes, as well as we can think about extension of the PDP with neighborhood, right? PDPN, it just, like, just like TSP is generalized to TSPN, right? So I just want to show you an example, right? If you optimize the UAV uh, you know, pass, you will find that you know, it's very different with or without the ordering constraint, right? For, for the visiting the ground nodes, right? For the, the figure on the left, there's no source and destination, uh, you know, uh, a constraint, but on the, the figure on the right, you have this source and destination. So you have this precedence constraint, you have to take into account in the TSP problem or in the, the PDPN uh, problem. But with this heuristic design, actually it's, it's very helpful for us to understand, right? The insights for the UAV trajectory design for communication purpose. And sometimes it also give us the optimal structure of the trajectory, but they're not, not sufficient because in general, they can only provide suboptimal trajectory. Why? Because you look at all TSP or TSP and PDP and you know, solutions, they can only provide you know, uh, you know, straight line a straight line uh, kind of uh, you know uh, paths uh, you know piecewise linear uh, you know over time right but we know in general UV tra trajectory can be arbitrary right it can be curved right so the definitely they cannot be optimal in general and also when we design the 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 TSP based uh, paths we ignore the communication and the trajectory constraint right so in general they cannot they may not even be feasible right if you add all of this mobility constraint or QAS constraint. And also very important, right? When we say UAV trajectory optimization is not just pass, right? Trajectory is a pass together with the speed along the pass, right? So trajectory uh, pass planning can only give you the, the, the pass information, but without the speed information, right? So for general UV trajectory optimization, we have to optimize pass and the speed together, okay? So this means that we still need a more general optimization framework to solve the UAV trajectory and communication uh, co-design problem, right? So this is what we're going to introduce uh, some additional techniques to help us solve this problem. Well, I just uh, remarked that the TSP and PDP based pass is still useful. In most of the cases, we use them as an initial pass and then we refine them, you know, based on, you know, uh, some other optimization uh, techniques. Okay, so uh, this is the generic problem. I previously I showed you now how to generally solve this type of problem. I think the most uh, uh, you know uh, difficult challenge is that uh, you know you think about all the trajectory variables that are continuous over time, right? That means that you know you have theoretically you have infinite number of variables to optimize, right? So this is not feasible, right? So the first uh, thing we need to do is that we have to describe discretize the trajectory into small paths or portions, right? You can think about, you know, you know, the, you can define a sequence of V points as such as the adjacent waypoints have to be sufficiently uh, close to each other to keep to such as, right? When you can think about the, the UAV to ground terminal channel, right? The distance does not vary too much, right? When the UAV fly from one V point to the adjacent V point, such as the channel realization or the channel statistics does not change, right? Over the adjacent Point. So we can uh, use a piecewise linear uh, you know, trajectory connecting these viewpoints to get approximate solution, trajectory solution for this problem. So in general, there are two types of a context, uh, you know, kind of discretization techniques. One is called the time discretization. The other is called the past discretization. Now time discretization is very simple. We just divide the total UAV flying time into small equal time intervals, right? And then uh, optimize the uh, the V points, right, uh, for, 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 for over those uh, equal time intervals. The problem with this approach is that you have to know the UAV flying time beforehand, right? But in some applications, for example, I want to send a UAV to serve a set of ground terminal to collect that data, right? We, we don't know how much time we need, right? So we may not know exactly the time T, well, you know, beforehand, right? So this approach may not be uh, applicable. Another constraint is another consideration is that it may not be efficient. Think about right. If let's say the UAV want to hover above some uh, uh, ground terminal, right, to 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 get the best communication channel with it for some amount of time, then this uh, this approach will be uh, this this will, will be not efficient because we have to use a lot of uh, equal small time interval to represent just one single hovering state, right? If the, the hovering time get larger, then we have a more inefficiency here. 
right? So this is a motive us to, to introduce a more generalized quantization or discretization techniques we call the past discretization. So in this case, we divide the UAV, uh, you know, you can think of a flying uh, trajectory into uh, also, you know, into a set of discrete V points, but we do not uh, necessarily uh, you know, constrain, they have to be equal time, right? They can be arbitrary time, right? For example, right, if the UAV hovering at a certain uh, location, then we can just, uh, you know, assume, you know, two V point adjacent V point Q1 equal to Q2 and with arbitrary hovering time T2, right? So this is a general uh, uh, a discrete decision techni technique can, can usually, uh, you know, uh, lead to more efficient optimization problem. And also I want to point out the T, the UAV flying time does not need to be known uh, beforehand if you apply the past discretization. So anyway, after we apply this uh, discretization techniques, right, the continuous uh, joint optimization problem becomes a discrete optimization problem, right? And then uh, we can solve them more uh, tractably, but the challenge is still there, right? I mean, uh, you know, you look at uh, the, the, the number of variables, right? The usually the trajectory variables and the communication variables, they're, 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 they're huge. And also uh, they usually most of the time they're, they're, they, 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 they uh, result in uh, non-convex constraints or objective functions. So in this case, right, uh, uh, we cannot solve them optimally uh, unless there are some special cases we can solve them optimally. But in general, we cannot solve them optimally uh, in, with a polynomial time. So we have to uh, uh, resort to some suboptimal approach, right? One commonly used approach is the block coordinate descent, right? So the, basically is that we have two blocks of variables. One is the trajectory variable, the other is the communication variable. So we optimize one with the other fixed and then iterate. And usually they will guarantee some local, good local convergence uh, uh, behavior. And you know, the suboptimal solution is also uh, quite, uh, with, uh, with quite good uh, quality. And then uh, after you uh, divide them into two blocks, if you solve uh, the optimization sub problem for each block uh, with the other block uh, fixed, uh, we also uh, often encounter non-convex optimization sub problem. So in this case, we can apply the success of convex approximation techniques, right? For example, right, if we want to uh, maximize, uh, sorry, if we want to maximize some function F0, but if we know, right, if F0 is a convex function, right, if you maximize a convex function, the problem is that it's not convex, right? And similarly for constraints, right? If you have a convex function greater than or equal to zero, the such constraint is not convex. But we can apply uh, the SCA techniques, right? We can uh, use the first order theta expansion, right? To get, uh, you know, for example, you know, the, the con convex function, we can get the, you know, a concave lower bound, right? And such as to change this function approximately to a concave function and the constraint becomes convex and then we can solve them efficiently in the iterative manner. And this technique is, is kind of universal, right? For example, right, in terms of achievable rate, <clears throat> which is not a, a concave function in terms of UAV uh, V point, uh, location variable QN, right? But using this, uh, uh, you know, ICA techniques, we can, we can get a lower bound, which is, uh, it becomes, a, uh, you know, a, a concave function, right? So the, the constraint becomes a convex. And similarly for some mobility constraint, for example, speed constraint, which is also convex, so we can use a lower bound to change to be a linear or convex function and so on and so forth. So if you combine such techniques, uh, you can solve, at least you can get some good, uh, you know, suboptimal solutions for, for solving this, uh, you know, this general optimization problem. But you in most of the time, the complexity is still a, a, a main hurdle. Right, because imagine, right, if you have a, you know, more and more UAVs, right, and the, each UAV has a longer and longer flying time, then you have more and more variables, right, and then the, the complexity will still be a, a, you know, a main issue. So we have to think about other techniques to reduce the complexity, right. So the two uh, recent work we have done uh, in this uh, direction. The first one is uh, uh, actually uh, uh, this one joint work is uh, Professor Chang. I, I think he's uh, around here. Just now I saw him. So he proposed, uh, you know, a generalization of the ADMM uh, method, which is called the BSUMMM method, right? So the main idea is that, right, instead of, uh, you know, using the BCD algorithm, right, to solve these two blocks of variables iteratively, right, why not we just solve them jointly, right? And the more importantly, right, uh, this method can enable us to, you know, divide the, 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 the multi-UAV trajectory design problem into a parallel single UAV. Uh, optimization problem. So if we have a multi-core processor, we can run 
the optimization for individual UAVs in parallel. And this will help you know, substantially reduce the computational time. Maybe not the computational complexity, but you can reduce the computation time, right? So it's a very useful approach. And the other approach we introduce is using the receding horizon, the sliding window based optimization. The idea is that instead of optimize each UAV trajectory, the entire trajectory, we divide it into small, uh, you know, small portions and use a sliding window, you know, to, to optimize each portion over time in a sequential manner. And also when we design this window, we have to be uh, pay uh, some attention, right? In terms of the, how we quantize the, the past, right? You would be introduced the unequal time of past discretization in each window to balance the trade-off between performance and complexity, right? So if you're interested, you can find more information uh, in these two papers. And, uh, and there's some case studies, uh, you know, one is that, you know, uh, as shown here, but I think for the sake of time, I will just, I think later I will share the slides to you and then you can, you can uh, find the, 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 uh, more information. So here, I think I can skip them. Uh, so basically they just give you a different, uh, you know, uh, 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 typical cases, right? Like a multi UAV enabled wise network or you know, the, the energy efficient UAV communication. And this, this paper is joint work with my postdoc, uh, Yung Zheng, and, and uh, this paper got, uh, luckily got the this year's Marconi uh, paper award. I, I think Ken just now mentioned, I think this is for your information. So basically, you know, uh, you know all of this, uh, I, maybe I just show you some quick example. It's just to, you know, for example, right? If I have two UAVs and serve some ground users, right? And now we can jointly design trajectory. And we have a new approach to mitigate the interference. That is by designing their trajectory jointly. That means at any particular time, we want to make sure the two UAV are maximally separated, right? To avoid strong interference between them, right? So you can think of now we have a new approach to mitigate interference by jointly designing their trajectories. And the other one is the, the UAV, the, if we design the UAV trajectory, taking into the UAV energy consumption, right? But this is not the communication energy consumption. It's the, it's the, it's the propor it's called the proportion energy consumption. Usually it's much higher, right? Than the energy, than the communication energy consumption. You can think of the orders of, you know, a hundred watts versus just a couple of watts, right? In the, for the commercial UAVs. So when we design the UAV communications, right? We have to, you know, take into <clears throat> their, their proportion energy consumption. Right, and but we have to come up some good model, mathematical models for such energy consumption, right? So I think that is one of the main contribution for this Marconi award uh, winning paper is that he give you a mathematical model for the UAV trajectory. And then we can use the trajectory, for example, we can op maximize the, the energy efficiency for UAV communication, right? That means that to define by uh, the amount of these communicated between the UAV and the ground terminal divided by the energy consumption, which is a proportion energy consumption, not the communication energy consumption, right? And sometimes we can have very interesting trajectory get, right? For example, right, if the, the in this case, uh, you know, the, the UAV want to serve a ground terminal, but it's a, it's a fixed wing UAV, so you cannot hover, you know, for fixed wing UAV, you cannot hover at the location, you have to move around. Right, because of its mechanism. So in this case, we find that actually the optimal trajectory follow this eight shape, right? Uh, why is the eight shape? It's because he want to get closer as possible to the ground terminal, but he had no, cannot hold where he have to continue moving, right? And then the, the eight shape, you know, to avoid the sharp turns, and this is the most uh, uh, efficient for the energy uh, in terms of proportion energy consumption, right? So if you consider such trade-off, throughput communication and energy trade-off, you have this very interesting you know, a shape this kind of trajectory. I think this is the first discovered in, in this paper. And more recent work, if you look, think about more recent work, we basically we extend the resource uh, into more general feeding channel models. So when you have a probabilistic the limestone channel or region feeding channel, when all of this uh, probabilistic the limestone probability or, uh, you know, region factor, it depends on the, uh, the elevation angles. So we have a more interesting 3D trajectories and based on the, the, the more complicated statistics of the channels. And also very interesting, we introduce a new approach is called the joint offline and online trajectory design. The main issue we have for the offline trajectory, right? Even you have perfect, you know, uh, statistics for the channels, you can only get a statistically good trajectory. You, that means when you launch the UAV along the trajectory, you cannot guarantee the communication performance, 
right? So we have to introduce a hybrid approach, right? We can we can design the U, offline the UAV trajectory based on the statistics, and then when we really launch the UAV, it still allow the UAV to change in real time. For example, is communication resource allocation based on its observed channels, and then uh, as well as uh, maybe the speed, right? You can you can still follow the same path, but you can vary the speed, right? If you have a like say obstacle, then I can increase my speed to get past, uh, bypass it as quickly as possible and so on and so forth. So this hybrid approach is uh, proved to be very efficient. Okay, I think I've already taken too much time. So I want to quickly jump to the, the second uh, uh, challenge, which is how to address the UAV to ground interference. So I want to quickly move to this slide uh, to, to just to illustrate why I say air, ground, air to ground interference is, is a so uh, critical issue, right? For UAV cellular communication. Now think about this, if let's say the traditional cellular network, right? If we want to coordinate or want to manage the interference, right? For a ground terminal, right? If we can, we only need to get the neighboring, you know, first tier or second tier of uh, base stations involved, right? I mean, we have a very limited, you know, uh, cooperative region, right? For interference management, right? Because terrace channel, you know, have this fading, right? Over substantial fading over past, over distance, right? So we don't need to resort to a large scale coordination for the interference, right? Localized interference management suffices. However, UAV has a line sign channel, right? So it can, its signal can reach to hundreds or even thousands of base stations, right? So if we want to apply the traditional uh, interference coordination technique, we have to have, a, you know, you know, a much larger size problem in terms of delay, in terms of the information exchange, in terms of complexity, all of this will become a very serious issue. And uh, you may ask, right, why not we just use orthogonal transmission, right? So the, the UAV communication will have no interference to the ground terminal. Well, it's possible, right? If you have very small number of UAVs, which is uh, most likely the scenario today, but if in the future, you will have a higher and higher density of UAV users, and this approach will not be effective. Then we have to do spectrum sharing between the UAV and the terrestrial user. And then means the interference issue becomes more uh, relevant and we have to think about new techniques to how to, uh, to solve them. So here, I just want to quickly uh, use uh, just a couple of minutes to go through them and to give you some uh, new ideas. Now, the first idea is that, okay, we can, we can explore the line of sign channel. I don't, either the interference is caused by the line of sign channel between the UAV and the ground terminal. But on the other hand, this is also an advantage. We can explore this line of sign channel to do a spectrum sending, right? Which is the classical radio approach, right? So the U, either in the downlink and uplink, the UAV can sense the environment. Right, to help is serving base station. Now, is serving base station has only limited information about the whole network, but the UAV can sense a much larger area, right? So based on that, it can help the serving base station to allocate the right resource plot and to avoid the strong interference to itself of, you know, to the, the co-channel terrestrial users, right? This could be an interesting approach, uh, but, you know, if you have more and more base station, uh, sorry, UAVs, eventually you cannot avoid. I mean, any resource plot you assign to UAV, you have to have some co-channel, you know, terrestrial users there. You know, some are near, some are far away. Now, in this case, right, how to cancel such interference? We can introduce this new concept. It's called cooperative interference cancellation, which is different from traditional COMP or NOMA, right? The approach is very interesting. Now, think about right, the terrestrial resource block, right? If a terrestrial resource block is, uh, is occupied by any user in the cell, usually the adjacent base station, they will not use the same resource block. So that means those base stations, they are becomes available, right? They're kind of idle base station. So they can be helping base station, right? To help receive the UAV signal, for example, in the opting scenario, and then decode the UAV message and then forward to the, to the terrorist, uh, terrestrial user serving base station to cancel such interference, right? And this is very different from COMP because COMP, you need to get all the base stations involved. And also different from NOMA because NOMA is that the terrestrial base station itself to cancel using SIC to cancel the UAV interference. But here we use the, the adjacent base station, which is available, which is idle, right? Helping base station to cancel more effectively. And similarly for the downlink, right? We can use those idle or helping base station to purposely send, you know, the terrestrial message. It's like interference. So send the interference to the UAV, right? To help it cancel, you know, the interference from 
from the other co channel base stations in the downlink, right? So this approach uh, is, is uh, the main idea is still, uh, you know, uh, you know, rooted from the classical, you know, interference cancellation, but it's, it's have some uh, new uh, uh, novelty uh, because it addressed the unique challenge here in the in the in the set in the UAV uh, ground interference cancellation scenario. And we also can explore the UAV trajectory design, right? For example, when we design the UAV trajectory, right? It can get a, you know, a wide, uh, can avoid entering into the, the high interference uh, uh, region, right? Especially when you have the, the so-called radio map information, right? You have the ISNR map, like for example, you know the ISNR distribution in the network. Then we can design the UAV trajectory such as, you know, always, you know, guarantee its ISNR performance in the, in the network. But in practice, right, you may not have such radio map available, right? So when you launch the UAV, the UAV does not know anything about the environment. So in this case, we have to learn the radio environment and at the same time optimize the UAV trajectory, right? So in this case, machine learning, especially deep learning, will be very useful, right? Because there are too many parameters and also, you know, uh, you know, to, to, to estimate and also the channel is a heterogeneous over, over space. So it's very difficult for us to assume some known uh, model. And, but traditional machine learning, it just uses the reinforced learning, right? It's just uh, to optimize the tra UAV trajectory uh, based on its reward. For example, you know, a data rate or, you know, outage probability. Ignore actually the, the, the information you received uh, at the UAV, it can be used to, 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 um, to find the, the statistical uh, information, right? Because there's a lot of correlations in the spatial channel, right, in, in, the, in, in the network. So we, we propose this simultaneous navigation and, uh, uh, you know, radio mapping techniques. I mean, the way, when we review uh, with the UAV uh, designed the, the, the trajectory, at the same time, he used the collected data uh, to visualize the, to estimate the radio web and then use that information to refine its trajectory. And we find this approach is better than the traditional approach. You just uh, use the machine learning itself to design the UAV trajectory, right? And it's, it will be more efficient use of the data the UAV collects in, in the real time. And oh, you can also think about in the future, right? We have a massive MIMO, right? I think massive MIMO is very relevant. I mean, you can, the base station equipped a large number of uh, antennas to have the, uh, the, the beam uh, the, uh, directly, not towards the, the terrorist user, it can also beam towards the UAVs, right? So they can help solve the interference issue between the UAV and the, the terrorist user. However, we know, right, the power contamination, right, is the fundamental, uh, you know, bottleneck, right, for massive MIMO. And for the, the UAV communication, because of the strong line sign channel and the interference issue, actually the pilot contamination becomes more severe, right? Because if you cannot resolve the pilot contamination, then all the beam direction will be not be accurate. And then you cannot resolve the interference between UAV and the ground user. So in this case, again, we can explore the line sign channel, right? Dominant channel for the UAV to ground to the base station, right? We can make use of that uh, to, to have very efficient techniques to resolve, to, to, to identify which channel it belongs to UAV, right? To help, you know, uh, you know resolve this uh, parallel contamination problem. So this figure shows, right? If you can resolve the parallel contamination, then you have a substantial performance improvement uh, in the, using the massive MIMO. Otherwise, the massive MIMO won't work, right? Because you already get the wrong channel, you know, due to the parallel contamination. And similarly, right? In the future, if you have a uh, swarm of UAVs, right? So if let's say all of them want to communicate to the same base station, then they will give a, a lot of a challenge, right? Because the pilot contamination problem become more severe. And also because the, all the UAVs in the same swarm, they are nearby, you cannot resolve their individual channels, right? Unless you have a really huge MIMO, right? A massive MIMO base station. So in this case, right, we can explore the D2D communication, right? I mean, instead of let all the UAVs to communicate the base station, we can just select one or you know, or, or two, right? It's a cluster head and then let them communicate with the base station, right? So this will help resolve the pattern contamination, the beam forming problem. And then same time, you know, can also guarantee the information exchange, you know, uh, sharing between the, the members in, in the same swarm and to make sure everybody can, can get a, a you know, good connection with the ground. Okay, so I think it's the time I, I should uh, wrap up. Uh, so I, I hope I, I give you a, 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 a relatively uh, clear overview about the, you know, how to integrate UAV into the cellular network and what are the, the main challenges, especially from the communication and signal processing perspective. There are two main paradigms. One is UAV as, uh, use UAV as a new terminal 
Well, the other one is to use UAV as new base stations or relays. And there are many challenges, actually. So here in this talk, I just focus on two of them. I think they are unique and also very critical, right, for, for UAV uh, integration into a cellular network, right? The one is the trajectory and communication co-design. Code the other one is the UAV terrestrial interference mitigation. So of course, there are many other uh, uh, we, uh, extensions and the future directions. And due to the, for the uh, sake of time, I won't talk to each of them, but later in the, in the QA and we can freely discuss uh, them. And in and, uh, and the end, I just want to uh, use this opportunity to make announcement actually is, is, a, is a, a do a favor for, for three former uh, members from my group. And now they are already uh, professors somewhere and they have other experts uh, in, in this area. They have this jointly organized the GSEC special issue uh, for UAV communication. And uh, I just want to remind you the, su the submission deadline is October 1st. So if I have some good results, please try to consider uh, submit to this uh, uh, this uh, special issue. I think it will be a good uh, forum uh, to publish your work. Uh, with that, I want to uh, stop here and uh, thanks a lot uh, for your attention. Yeah, Ken, I want to pass back to to you. Yeah. All right, all right. Uh, I think um, okay. I think I I will take over from it here. So oh, okay, um, cool. yeah. okay, yeah, no problem. Since I'm responsible for the Q and A sessions, so uh, actually we got quite a long list of questions for Professor Zhang. So okay, okay, sure. Okay, uh, so the I will first, try my best. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the first question came from Neil. So he asked like, uh, so when the UAV actually at as a base stations, and how does it communicate with the backhole network in this case? Okay, so Go there are two. The, yeah. Okay, there's oh, no, a no, very no. good. Oh uh, uh, no, I think there was uh, some interval. Uh, uh, please continue. Uh, okay, so actually, uh, there there are two types of application, right? One is that uh, you know, for example, you will set send the UAV as a base station to collect the data from the sensors, and mm -hmm. then you uh, you can uh, process them offline. So you don't need a real time uh, backhaul. But if let's say if you want the real time, for example, internet connection, right? Then the, the UAV can only serve as a relay. I mean, it can only communicate with the, the ground terminal uh, and then forward the data to some ground gateway or some satellite. So in this case, uh, you know, a backhaul is very important. So as I mentioned, right, if you consider the backhaul, then there will say like a new constraint, you know, in your optimization, trajectory optimization probably, because when you fly closer to the ground terminal, maybe you'll fly further away from uh, the ground base station. Right. So when you design the trajectory, you have to balance between these two. But it also depends. If your backhaul, let's say, is through some satellite, right? The satellite is a very high altitude. So whatever we design the UV trajectory, right? The distance, uh, you know, compared to the, the distance from the satellite is uh, negligible, right? So you can think of the link condition that's not very much uh, over the UAV location. But if you have, uh, you know, the backhaul is provided by the ground base station, and then it may be more sensitive to the UAV. Uh, trajectory uh, or distance. So in that case, we have to jointly uh, consider uh, the, 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 the link with the, the, the ground terminal as well as the back when you design the trajectory. Yeah, I don't know whether this this, this is good or not. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I hope that the speaker answered your question, Neil. So I guess uh, you have two more questions in the queue, so <laughs> no worries. Uh, you have time to respond to this. Uh, so the second question came from Professor Chen Han, uh, Henry Chen from uh, CHK. So uh, the question is, is there any standardization activities that are going on to incorporate UAV in the future communication systems? So for example, like, uh, for example, like SpaceX is going to start the service uh, next year. So if that happens, then how is that, how will the role, uh, what will be the role of the UAV as a base station? Yeah, excellent question. Actually, this talk, I, I want to focus on more from the signal precising perspective. So I didn't talk about uh, standardization activities because too much things I have to cover. Mm -hmm. I just want to focus on one, you know, uh, one or two problems to address in this mm -hmm. talk. But it's, it's very relevant. I, th I think, I think uh, you know, if you think about UAVs, right, actually, uh, you know, besides the standardization, actually, there's a very common concern is a public safety. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know, yeah. you look at the government agencies. You look at, you know, you know, the, the, the use the, the the normal users, right? They all have this uh, the concern, right, about the safety issue, and this is also uh, related to the the standardization. So what I mean is that, okay, you can think of this way, right? If let's say we put for um, a lot of effort to push the standardization active, for example, 3 gpp already, already launched the study atom for UAV uh, using okay. the existing uh, LTE network. 
uh, to support. Uh, you, if you're interested, you can look at the report, their report online. So uh, now they are they, they have they are continuing this discussion, you know, to see five five G, you know, whether they can integrate uh, uh, the UAVs, uh, you know, and maybe as user for the most of the cases, not the base station because the base station you most of most of the niche application is from remote area. So those area, those those the maybe the safety, you know, the, the interference with terrestrial is not that big issue. You you can just focus on how to design the UAV itself, the trajectory and the communication to serve the ground terminals, right? But this is the, but if you think of UAV as user, and then it's very critical, right? The standardization is very critical, mm -hmm. and also the safety is revolved. So what I I think is that if let's say we can put a effort, you know, into this standardization, and then we will we will, let's say you know we we have a we have cleared that 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 uh, uh, drop. Then you know to the public, right? The impression will be okay. Oh, you know, this, uh, you know the the five G or four G LTE network is already allow UAV to get access. That means that the communication in terms of real safety reliability is already guaranteed, right? And this will dispel the the common folks' uh, the concern, mm -hmm. right? And this will help accelerate you know the UAV commercialization. This is my opinion. So it's very important. Now, in terms of recent activity, you talk about uh, SpaceX. I think SpaceX is uh, is uh, quite different because they, they want to send uh, there's a, a satellite network, right? It's uh, it's, uh, it's not like uh, like the UAV. Uh, it's a very low altitude uh, where, where I'm talking about. But you know, uh, satellite UAV and the satellite integration, I think, is the future trend. Okay, whether whether you can think about either the UAV as a user, as a base station, as an intermediate relay between the satellite and uh, the 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 base uh, the base station on the ground, but because UAV has many times, I actually I skip one slide. It, it, UAV doesn't mean that uh, you know you you have most of people uh, we have seen right. It, you know it's like flying around you know this kind of drones right. Mm. UAV is also include the high altitude platform like balloons right. Mm. You know mm. this can also serve as intermediate relay link between the satellite and the and the ground terminal. So you know, I, I can envision, right, in the future, right, you can think about UAV as a base station. There are also a lot of applications. But most of the, I think, more, more importantly is either in the remote area or in the, uh, you know, in the, as, a, as a relay, you know, high altitude, as a high altitude platform. So for, for that direction, I think the standardization is continuing, right, it's continue on. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, the UAV as users, actually, this is more relevant to our, <laughs> as, a, as a user perspective. You know, and so this one, I think, uh, you know, we still need a uh, more effort. You know, about that, it's still it's still ongoing. You know, 5G. You know, they're still considering UAV. The study group is continues. So I think these two paradigms are both promising, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, for but for the safety issue is very critical, and it's most relevant when the UAV is used as user. Yeah, so actually, Professor Chen left a little bit earlier on, so but he will see the recordings. Okay. Uh, so yeah. the next question is coming from Chen Xiao. So he asks, so if the if the communication occurs at every time slot of the UAV trajectories, so is there any stability problems here? And how do we guarantee the stability of communication during the trajectories? Yeah, this is a very good question. As I said, it cannot guarantee if you design an offline trajectory, no matter how you assume Right, you know the, the 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 channel because the wireless channel really change and depends on the the scatters, right? The high-rise buildings, you know, uh, you know obstacles. Uh, unless you have a global radio map available, right? And then I assume that map is is a, is a, is a stationary. Then you can design the trajectory to guarantee the performance in every time slot, right? But if let's say you only have partial knowledge, right? You have an incomplete radio map or the radio map just given on the average channel measurement. Then when you design the trajectory, you cannot guarantee. This is why I'm saying the hybrid approach is very promising, or the, you know, the machine learning approach. When you launch the UAV, you have to learn the radio environment and then do some adaptation, right? And such as you can improve the real-time uh, experience. And this is critical, right? And this, I think, is a good direction, future direction for UAV trajectory design. You cannot, we cannot just focus on offline, no matter how you designed it. You cannot mm -hmm. guarantee the real-time performance. So this hybrid approach, you know, using some machine learning techniques or you know, using some adaptive, uh, you know, techniques or sensing, you know, I think is is very promising. Yeah. Okay. So next, uh, we got two questions from Neil. So the first question uh, is about like why is the channel estimation not considered while designing the tra trajectories? Mm -hmm. uh, do Do you want me to ask the second question as well? <laughs> Right now, uh, we want to answer the first one, just. 
it's okay. I can just uh, address briefly. Yeah, okay. channel estimation is always important. I mean, for all types of communication and also for UAV communication. Now, the reason why in our early work, we didn't consider the communication overhead. The reason is very simple because we consider line sign channel. So line sign <laughs> channel, you, you relatively, you look at the, the channel strengths very, very slowly over time because no matter how UAV mm -hmm. flies, you know, how, how fast it flies, it compared to the distance between UAV and the ground terminal, right? The horizontal movement, right? I, I mean, mm -hmm. in each time slot, your channel strength will not change much, right? Mm -hmm. While the phase will change rapidly, it depends on the speed, right? Not mm -hmm. the speed, the magnitude, also the direction. But mm -hmm. usually, you know, we have a lot of signal processing techniques you can uh, compensate this, uh, the so-called estimated Doppler and such as to compensate mm -hmm. the phase. Mm -hmm. So I think a channel estimation overhead is not that substantial. Now, Generalizing this to uh, arbitrary channel, not just a line of sand channel, right? You may have probably the line of sand channel. I mean, sometimes you have occasionally blockage by, by the buildings, high rise buildings, and that's easily detectable, right? If you, if you have a, a substantial channel drop, that means the most likely you have, you have a, you know, a blockage there. Mm -hmm. And then, as I said, you have micro diversity, right? UAV can connect many available ground base stations, right? You can just change another base station, which is you have a line of sand. Right. So mm -hmm. I think those are already can be managed by existing cellular or traditional uh, terrestrial, uh, you know, uh, association or handover, this kind of technique. So I don't consider them as a main challenge as UAV communication. Yeah. I see. So uh, the next questions are like, what are the opportunities and challenges for incorporating UAV, MIMO and intelligence service? let's say in the future of communication oh. systems. Oh, that's, that's very, okay. Very good. I mean, uh, it's talk about intelligent service. Okay. That's a, another big topic. I mean, you have an opportunity and maybe I can share with you with another uh, time that I mean about the intelligent service. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, in my opinion, there are two ways to integrate intelligent service into UAVs, right? The first one is that you just mount the U intelligent service on the UAV, right? Or some high altitude platform. Now, you ha but you have to, Make sure because we know, right? The intelligent surface is just passive, right? So it reflects signal. So the signal, end-to-end -end signal, it will get double re attenuation. So the distance is, is very important, right? If, you, if I have a large distance for the surface to both transmitter and the receiver, then the attenuation will be huge. Unless you have the gigantic large surface. Otherwise, you will calculate the link budget. It won't be beneficial. So in practice when we deploy, you know, this uh, UAV mounted uh, uh, intelligent surface, we have to make sure it's either closer to the base station or closer to the user or user cluster, right? To shorten the link, uh, the, 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 the uh, double uh, pass loss. Uh, if we can uh, solve that problem, then it's promising because it's very low cost, right? You can think of a, some passive relay flying over the, uh, you know, uh, air and when there's a need and then can fly there to serve as a, as a relay and uh, you don't need to radiate a new signal into the network and there's no interference. So there's a lot of advantages, but uh, as I said, right, you have to carefully design the trajectory or the location of such uh, uh, UAV uh, mounted in surface uh, to, 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 to maximize the, the, the performance, the link performance. I see. Now, on the other hand, we can also use the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, use the Italian surface on ground to help improve the UAV communication. And the, this is similar like uh, other, you know, uh, mm. uh, you know, ground applications we have, because uh, you, you can just, uh, for example, right, you can just think about, you, you, you can enhance the link, right, between either the ground terminal or base station with the, with the, the, the UAV, right, just like uh, the ground uh, user, right, is the same, right. So for that, I don't think, uh, I mean, you can just apply uh, similar results in in the you know in our you know terrestrial uh, intelligent surface work, and then combining it with the UAV trajectory design, I think uh, that should not be difficult to to extend. Yeah. All right. So uh, next up, we got a question from Joachim, so who wakes up very early. So uh, so the question is about the following. So uh, in the presentation, you have mentioned that, that the UAVs can be done as can, uh, can be illustrated by like airplanes that are pretty like energy efficient, but with a sort of like a constrained movement, or they can be like uh, quadcopters, so they are like less energy efficient and very flexible movements. So do you have any thoughts about what types of these UAVs will be the most efficient, the most useful in different consider in the different scenarios you consider? Mm -hmm. And also yeah. are the airplanes trajectories feasible to optimize in practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're all practically relevant questions. Now, 
first of all, my our optimization framework applies to any types of UAVs, right? Some are low, low mobility, some are high mobility. Now, if you think about in practice, for example, airplane, right? You already have a fixed trajectory, right? Then uh, maybe we have less degrees of freedom to optimize in terms of trajectory. But still, right, we can we can optimize the, the UAV flying speed along the trajectory. If let's say that this, this, uh, this airplane or UAV have some stringent communication requirement and jointly optimize with the terrestrial resource allocation, right? So what I mean is that this joint optimization uh, framework is universally applied, right? It's, it's, it's for the scenario, whether you have a freely controllable uh, trajectory or some partially controllable trajectory. And in terms of different types of UAV, which one is more efficient? It's the, it completely depends on the specs uh, for the UAVs, right? What is the energy consumption model? What's the mobility model? I, I don't, I don't think I can come up, uh, you know, a, a, a absolute answer, yes or no. I know the, the fixed wing is better than rotary. I think it depends on the applications. So the, the good thing about this optimization framework is that you can, you can, you can put those, uh, you know, specs right into the mathematical constraints and design their trajectory and evaluate their performance, and then you can. Find Find the best uh, suitable, uh, you know, uh, one for for your application. Yeah. All right. So th thanks for the answer. So uh, the next question is from Lingzhe. So he asks. So in practice, most of the communication requests may be instantaneous that are not known to the UAV beforehand. And so, how does the UAV path designing can take this into account? Uh, for instance, the UAV is set from to fly from uh, node one to node two in turn. So then when the UAV leaves node one and goes to node two, they will, and suppose that there is now a communication request from node one, it's being sent to the UAV. Should okay, I get a point, back? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a point. So basically your point mm -hmm. is that, you know, if you mm -hmm. have a time varying uh, ground traffic, right? And mm -hmm. then, you know, when you design the UAV trajectory, how, how are you going to uh, make it practical? Okay, you can think of, as I said, this joint optimization problem, right? There are many different variations. Right. So as I said, there's another uh, line of work is called the UA placement. Right. So basically, it's a given the ground traffic at, at the time being, you optimize the UAV uh, location. Right. But after you've done that, it's not like one time only. Right. Or soft. Right. It, it, when, when the ground traffic uh, dynamic change, then you can readjust the new set of UAV placement locations. Right. So, so it evolves over time. Okay. So what, what I, the problem I talk about today is that you, you already have a pretty good knowledge about the, the, the ground traffic or the data requirement or communication requirement, right? But you may have different channel knowledge, right? So this is the focus of my today's talk. But the optimization techniques, right, we introduce or the framework is uh, generally applies to other scenario, right? Even for the case that, as I said, right, you, you, you may deploy the UAV and based on the ground traffic, uh, you know, uh, uh, change, then you have to readjust. I mean, this, this is, this, you can also use our tactic to solve this uh, slot by slot in the slot by slot manner, right? Mm -hmm. Based on the update of the ground traffic. So, so that's doable. Yeah, that's doable. Yeah. I see. So, uh, next, so the next question is coming from Wang Man. Uh, so he has, so he asked like whether we can compare the performance of the deep uh, reinforcement learning te uh, techniques with uh, the BCD and the SCA method that you also propose in this talk? Hmm. Well, I think the setup is a bit different, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, I, it depends on how you apply the machine learning to solve what kind of problem. Now, mm -hmm. machine learning basically you can use for two purposes. One is that it's just for the computation complexity reduction perspective. That means you have to learn, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the optimization uh, algorithm, certain parameters, Right, so when you apply in real time, you can save the real time computational mm -hmm. complexity, and this is a definitely applied. I mean, you can use the BCD, right, to get a good trajectory, and then use that to train a neural network to good to get some good mm -hmm. parameters, and then with the real time design, you can you can do it. Uh, you can you can reduce the the real time computation time. But but you know, frankly speaking, I haven't compared that. You know, none of my mm -hmm. students or collaborators have done that. It's good to do, but it's very heuristic. Because it, it will depend on how you realize the, the, the neural network, right? Yeah. And sometimes you reduce the complexity, but you have more training time. So if let's say I already designed everything offline using BCD, then is there a fair comparison? You know what I mean? You know? So, so, so this, is a, this is a one reason. The other one is that if you learn, use the optimized trajectory from BCD, how you can do better than 
the, the mm. already the, the best you know offline trajectory optimized. This is something we have to think yeah, about it, right. right? If you can show convincingly, right? I mean the the, the neural network after you do all of this learning, it can even do better than the BCD and regardless the, the network topology change. And that would be fantastic. But based on my knowledge, I haven't seen such deep learning network work mm. I mean, from this perspective, you know, computational complexity reduction at the same time, you know, achieve better performance. I, I haven't seen such work. Now, the other application for machine learning is for the case that you don't know the radio environment, right? The channel statistics, mm. right? The, you know, the, you know, whether you have a blockage somewhere or, you know, or the, 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 the traffic pattern, the ground communication no traffic pattern. So it's also very complicated. Now, now, if you apply the machine learning, right? And then the, in this case, it, there's no point to compare with BCD. So the best way is to, 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 to the benchmark, you can get always get the upper bound. The upper bound is that you assume you know the radio map. You know all mm -hmm. the realization, right? Mm -hmm. Then you use the offline trajectory, you get upper bound. And then you apply whatever machine learning technique, you see how close you can get. As mm -hmm. I said, this is again, very heuristic, right? You change another neural network uh, uh, application or you change another setup, maybe the performance gap will be different. So this is a, sometimes I hesitate you know, to do such comparison directly because it will give some misleading results. I don't want to give misleading results. <laughs> so I leave that opportunity to other people to explore, but at least you can use the BCD framework to get upper bound, mm -hmm. or you can use it as a, you know, the input to train your neural network. Yeah. I see, okay. So uh, the next question is coming from Man Yuan. So, um, so he asked, so shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't the maximum turning angle be considered into the trajectory as optimizations for the UAV? Hmm. Uh, that's, that's the, you know, you can add that constraint. As I said, <laughs> this is such an additional mobility constraint, right? You can do it, uh, yeah. but mm -hmm. I haven't done that in my work, but I think it's doable. It's just some, uh, you know, maybe in some non-convex constraint that then you have to use some of the technique like ICA, uh, you know, to deal with that. But what I mean, I, what I want to show is that, right, if you want to uh, take into the UAV energy consumption, especially for fixed wing UAVs, then you should avoid a sharp turning angles, right? Because it's very mm -hmm. energy consuming. Yeah, exactly. Right? So yeah. that's the insight I want to give, right? So you can think about that's the very important practical consider if you consider UAV mm -hmm. energy consumption. Yeah. A sort of like the smoothness of the trajectories. Yes, so you should avoid sharp turns, you know, or, you yeah. know, abrupt change in terms of speed, you know, that, that, that very energy consuming. So this mm. means that trajectory design is very important, mm. right? You, mm. you have to, you know, balance between the energy consumption uh, and develop the communication performance when you design this trajectory. Yeah. Okay, so next up, we got a question from Zhao Wei. So, um, <clears throat> so he is asking to compare like using UAVs or adding just like a fixed base stations on the on, in the systems, and which one is going to be better in terms of the cost, performance, and stability? Uh, you mean comparing UAV with a ground base station in terms of cost and stability? Yeah, am I right? Oh, mm -hmm. I think I think uh, they are used for different purposes. I think you cannot. Let's say you one day you replace all the ground base station to be uh, UAV base station. It's not possible, right? <laughs> so. So the we still we still need to uh, leverage the, the the ground network the satellite network, and the UAV uh, base station is just uh, you can think about auxiliary uh, you know uh, uh, base stations. Uh, either in the case that you don't have a satellite coverage, uh, you know, in some remote areas or in some emergency situations, or in some kind of uh, you know in the future you may use the UAV as some relays, you know, especially like personalized the communication. Right, you can, you know, one example we have in mind is that in the future, right, every car, if you look, if you have vehicle to vehicle communication, right, if you want to get better, you know, communication, right, because the, the, the vehicle, the, the car on the ground have a very limited, uh, uh, you know, visual, visual, uh, you know, uh, you know, to the art, to the scenario. But if let's say every car is equipped the UAV, right, mm -hmm. and then the, when the UAV, the car moves, the UAV can move, uh, can, you know, also moves along, or maybe even ahead of it. Right, and to get to sense the environment, you know, to do, and then it will it will improve the awareness of the, the ground terminal, right, the, the 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 car, right, to improve the V to V or you know this kind of communication. So so what I mean is that is you can use it as a helping nose, right, in, in most of the cases. But if you see you want them to replace the whole entire you know cellular network, it's not possible because it's already we already spend a lot of 
many, right, to build the cellular network, right? So, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not uh, easy to to, to re completely replace it. So I think it's just trying to use the UAV in the most efficient and uh, in the mm. innovative way, and then, then you can have very interesting cost-effective solution to solve some existing problems. Yeah. Yeah. So the next question is from uh, Li Hua. So uh, you so you have mentioned that in your presentation that UL LLC is one of the is one area that has mentioned that, that such that the UAV can play a role in. Mm -hmm. So uh, could you please talk about how can the UAVs be practically good solutions for these applications? And intuition here is that we cannot really fly the UAVs all over the sky all the time. And also a UAV mm -hmm. cannot always guarantee a low latency and reliability due to the mobility issues. Yeah. No, actually, I think, I think uh, if you think about all of these questions, right, you have to think about from two perspectives. Mm -hmm. Either UAV is a terminal or UAV is a base station, right? Mm -hmm. So just now, uh, and when I mentioned about URLC, I'm mainly referring to the case that UAV is a terminal, right? Mm -hmm. So if the cellular network can provide this URLC, right, for UAV, then even the UAV flies, you know, in a randomly over the space, right? You can get very reliable CNPC, you know, this control message in real time, right? That's in 99.999, right? This kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? So in this case, sir, we can we can guarantee, we can uh, dispel the public, you know, concern about the safety because you can guarantee, right? Nine, the five nine, you know, kind of reliability for the controlling, right? So it should be okay, right? I mean, it should be safe. Right to let the UAV fly, right? <laughs> okay, but you yeah. know the other on the other hand, right? If let's say why you why uh, how you can use UAV as a base station to help improve the ground terminal, uh, URLC that that is something new. Uh, actually, there's some as I said, there's a fundamental challenge there because the UAV, uh, you know, you have to fly sufficiently closer to the ground terminal, right, to help. So as an example, I mentioned, right? If I say one UAV is associated with a ground vehicle, mm -hmm. then you can you can do this job. But if let's say you re rely on one UAV to apply UIRC to a large number of ground terminals when there's a need, then there's a challenge because the UAV have to spend some time to fly closer to them to provide mm -hmm. reliable performance. So that will be a fundamental challenge. Yes. Okay. So then, uh, so we have a question from Shamin. So uh, does the so asking like, does the, does the data collected by the UAVs, can it be extended to any other types? Like for example, video, video data that has time requirements. So uh, to be more precise, now if, so if the data collection is done in a real time mode, uh, what are the special issues that we should pay attention to? Yeah, so if a, if a real time real time data collected, right? That uh, if let's say you have to send back to the ground in real time also, Mm -hmm. Right, then there will be uh, the payload data, right? So we have to, okay. when you design, like for example, you design UAV for sensing, uh, you mm -hmm. know, UAV as a sensor, right? To sense the ground, like the temperature, whatever. And then you have to send those information real time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, back to the ground. That, that means when you design the UAV trajectory, it's not just for this application purpose. Let's say you maximize the number of sensors you cover. And at the same time, you have to design the trajectory such to meet the communication back call. Right, so you have to make sure you can send back the real-time sensing data back to the ground gateway or base station, right? So, so this is the this is how you can think about you know if you have the real-time uh, requirement for 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 sending back uh, you know this this uh, the application data uh, to the ground, and then they will have a more interesting trajectory optimization uh, problem, and you have a different utility, not just communication utility. You may have other utility. You have to uh, take into uh, account. Yeah. All right. So uh, second last question from Jane. So uh, oh, okay. in, I mean, in the queue, I mean, we there might be more questions coming up. <laughs> okay, oh. so uh, in view of the sporadic uh, arrival characteristics of the UL LLC traffic, so how can the UAV, which is like energy constrained aerial platform, can be used to guarantee the QoS requirements for the served users? Yeah, I think I already addressed that question already. Yeah. So okay. yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. If, if let's say you, you want to use one single UAV or mm. area platform to, to cover all the, mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. the ground nodes and to guarantee their URLC, then it will be very challenging because you, mm -hmm. you know the so-called yeah, delay, delay trade-off, you have to wait until the UAV fly closer 
right, to the ground terminal to, to, to provide mm -hmm. such service. Yeah, so that means that if you want to solve that problem, either you, uh, you can employ multiple UAVs, right, mm -hmm. to, to explore their cooperation, right, to, mm -hmm. uh, such as you can always get this diversity. You know, every ground terminal, you can always have a backup UAV, right, to serve. Mm -hmm. Then maybe that can help solve the problem. And that's a good direction for future work. Actually, you know, in most of the work uh, we have today is that we, we don't have a, have a good, clear understanding about multi-UAV. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, coordinated uh, network mm -hmm. in terms of trajectory design or application. I think we have some initial work, but actually, uh, I think in terms of cooperation, that aspect, uh, we think, I think it's still a lot to e explore. Yeah. yeah. In terms of fundamental tools, yeah, we use to, to get efficient designs. Yeah. All right. So uh, the last question is coming from Austin. So uh, he is interested, he or she is interested in how can that UAV be applied it in edge computing, since UAV is now constrained by compu computing power and also battery energies? Mm. I think in terms of battery energy and the computing power, I think battery energy is more critical. Yeah. <laughs> because the computing power nowadays, uh, you know, is uh, it's not really that uh, energy consuming compared to the, you know, the, the moving energy, right? I mean, so, so, but I agree in terms of cost, I think it's very relevant, right? Because whether you can, you know, if you if you put a very uh, uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, a lot of computing uh, resources on the UAV, of course the UAV cost will increase. So so it, it even forget about energy issue, but the cost it will be goes up. So if I already have the the cellular connection with the UAV, let's say we already integrate the UAV as a new user into the cellular network, and the cellular base state can already provide the edge computing service, then why not, right? You can you can you can always explore such uh, uh, you know. Uh, you know, uh, new new feature of the cellular network to 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 offload to the UAV uh, computation task, but you have to make sure, right? I mean, when you offload this computation task, right? You is a, is a, uh, you know, when you design the trajectory, right? You have to make sure, right? You always can collect back, right? The, the result, mm -hmm. right? You, mm -hmm. Let's say I send this this drop to this base station. When this drop base station done the drop, and then the UAV already out of the coverage of this base station, right? Then then is 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 will be difficult. Right, so I think in terms of trajectory design, you can put that into the constraint and then, uh, you know, consider a, a more general optimization problem. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so actually, we got a new question coming up just uh, just now from Lely. So uh, so many UAV based communication works actually assume that you have nine of side channels. So what uh, which is somewhat ideal and which and what are the probabilistic channel models that considers both nine of side or more nine of side cases? So in practice, the channel can actually be varying since uh, the locations of the UAV is also changing. So and so, is there any good way to incorporate this uh, topology information when you when we uh, when we go on to model the trajectories and the communication designs? I think your your concern is about the channel model. As I said, you know, early work, including most of my work in this area, we assume line of sight channel. Now, mm -hmm. it's uh, of course, I mean, one justification is that in the rural mm -hmm. area, right, line of sight channel is practical value. But actually, if you look at Qualcomm report, right, you know, you know, other sources, right, even if the UAV is a more a higher than, you know, two hundred meters above the ground, right, it's basically all line of sight channel, yeah, with the ground. Even you have the you know suburban you know area. Right, uh, probably the live some probably is very high. I think I cannot remember exactly. Is a ninety nine or percent or something like that. Yeah. So so basically, you can think of most of applications, right? Live sign or at least you can think of a high probability live sign channel are practically relevant for UAV. But right, as I said, when we design the UAV for app, it depends on application, right? If let's say you know you want to send a UAV to collect the sensor from all the ground, right? You know the locations. Right, mm -hmm. arbitrary location. Then you may have certain blockage. Then that means mm -hmm. that you know you can even the probability is small, right? But maybe you have the case that you have you, you don't have a you know along the trajectory you really don't cannot find any line sign with a ground terminal at at a given location. So when we design the UAV trajectory, right? If we take that that you know uh, that uh, you know uh, uh, probability line sign channel into account, that is the most popular one. Another one is the region feeding channel. Uh, it's an even mm -hmm. higher attitude for UAV. Then you have a region feeding channel where the region factor depends on the elevation angle. I mean, 
the, these two models are most uh, uh, you can think of prevalent in, in, in the literature. I think, I think the reason why, uh, actually we have, I, just now I also introduced, so we have some also recent work to extend the trajectory design from line sign channel to those statistical channel models. But what, uh, my point is that, right, if it depends on the application and the environment, right? So most of the time, right, it's a, I think it's safe to start with, uh, you know, the line sign channel assumption. But in some scenario, right, as I said, right, if you're really critical, right, if you want to guarantee the coverage and, and also the lime sun probability may not be really that high in some, you know, urban uh, high rise building, you know, this kind of scenario, then we have to take into the channel studies into account to get a more efficient trajectory and combine with some real time adaptation. I, I mentioned the hybrid approach uh, to, to, to improve the performance. But as I said, right, as you know, those are only for those applications, right, really have uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the statistics, the channel, the statistics really matters. I think most of the applications, I think line sign assumption is, is a good to start with, right? To get the insights into the system design or, or you know, get the initial trajectory. I, I think is, a, is a already a practically uh, sufficient, yeah. Yeah, so uh, thanks Professor Jans for answering all the questions. <laughs> so, and I also pleasure. thank you all for the very active participations. So uh, let me do a last, like a final call for questions if there's anything. So, uh, and meanwhile, let me, uh, let me also make a few announcements. So uh, actually we'll be uh, having a short pause for the next week. And, and then on the week, that is two weeks later, we'll have our next speakers, uh, which is uh, Professor Santiago Sagara from the Rice University. And we will switch gear a little bit back to distributed optimize, uh, distributed signal processing and actual data science. And um, and also, I would like to repeat uh, one of the one of the comments from our attendees, uh, Neil. So, who would like to hear more from Professor John about intelligent services in the future talks? And actually, there's another advertisement from our organizations. <laughs> so uh, there's so actually on the twenty fourth of uh, July, which is three weeks later, uh, there will be a talk from Professor Emil Bjornsson, who is who will actually talk about intelligent reflecting surfaces. So please stay tuned with this uh, seminar series. Oh, that, So that I should say you guys' interest yeah. is already taken into consideration in finding the speakers. Yeah. All right. That's good, yeah. I make this seminar series even more pro you know, <laughs> promising <laughs> you know, in the future. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. That's great. Yeah, you are making a new brand yeah, for Signal Precising Society. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I this is the largest number of questions I've ever seen. Oh, by the way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I hope I have done. Oh, uh, yeah. I think I just want to uh, make sure that there is no further questions from the attendees, and then so that I can safely stop the recording. <laughs> okay. So I guess none. So I will. Uh,